One of the most useful things about my phone is the GPS and the map application. I mean, if those were the only two functions of my phone, it would be worth carrying around with me. It helps me find my way and it keeps me from getting lost. The other day I had a meeting with a guy in an area of town that I was not familiar with. And back in the old days, I would have had to get detailed directions from him on how to find his office. But now all he needed to do was give me his address. I put that in my map application on my phone, and I'm good to go. My phone will then guide me to my destination. My phone is able to communicate with the GPS satellites orbiting the Earth and show me my position on a map on my phone screen. And it's able to show me the location where I'm trying to get. And if I'm so inclined, I could even have my phone speak directions to me as I'm driving, telling me when to turn and what street to go on and so forth. I mean, this is common experience for most of us, right? Well, the Bible is like a GPS for life. It helps us find our way and keeps us from getting lost. The Bible can give us direction on how to live our life, help us figure out right from wrong, help us make wise choices in life, show us how to behave and how to treat people, and most importantly, it helps us find and know Jesus Christ, the most important discovery any human being can make. We live in a very complicated world, not just technologically, but morally. The moral choices that we are faced with in our day are unlike anything that any other generation of people have ever had to face. The subtlety required to wisely navigate our way through many of these issues in our day is overwhelming. The gray areas keep getting wider, and the line between right and wrong keeps growing fainter. The need for the followers of Christ to know and to understand their Bible is more important today than ever. And one of the amazing things about our day is that we can have this GPS for life right here on our phone. Just like our map app. And just like we have a GPS radio in our phone that gets location data from the GPS satellites orbiting the earth, we have the Holy Spirit with us. Well, we're continuing a series on the foundations of the church based on the example of the first church in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And we want to continue that today. If you'll flip over to Acts chapter 2, verse 42... We'll begin reading there, and it says, if I was using my phone Bible app, I could get there a lot faster. I used to be really nervous about using my phone app, though, in church, because I was afraid you guys were thinking I was texting, so I'd be sitting there. I can't believe the pastor's texting in the middle of the church service. Really, I was using my Bible app. Really. And I'm assuming that's what you're doing with your phone right now. So Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, the four foundations that were present in the first church are found in verse 42. They were worship, the word of God, fellowship, and prayer. And we talked about worship last time. Today, we're going to talk about the word of God. 
It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching or to the learning of the word of God. They devoted themselves to the learning of the word of God. They gathered together regularly to listen to and learn from the apostles as they taught the people about Jesus Christ and the things that Jesus had taught them. I think it's worth noting that from the very beginning, the first days of the church, it has been an educational institution and a learning center. A growing church is a church that teaches the word of God and is filled with people who are committed to learning the will of God. I mean the word of God. Well, the will of God too, but they're committed to learning the word of God. The great commission given by Jesus Christ was essentially a command to teach. Over in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It says, go and make disciples. A disciple is a student, a learner, someone who's seeking to duplicate within himself his master, who in this case is Jesus Christ. There are many things that the church can do and should do. There are social causes and humanitarian activities that we can engage in, for example. But if we neglect the call to teach and proclaim the word of God, then we're failing to fulfill our Christ-given mission. In our own day, we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching by learning the Bible, since it contains what the apostles taught. And there is a glut of material and ways to access that material in our day. I mean, the amount of material available is incalculable. And the different ways of accessing that material is staggering. We can go to live teaching events like a church service or a seminar or a conference or a retreat. We can listen to or watch recorded teachings in various forms. We can read books and magazines. We can read weblogs and on and on. We're without excuse in our day in regards to having access to the word of God, the apostles' teaching. The only thing that prevents any of us from devoting ourselves to the learning of the word of God is the personal discipline needed to take advantage of the many opportunities available to us. There is not another subject in all of the world that is more available to more people more affordably than Bible teaching. I mean, centuries ago, Books were expensive and scarce, for example, but not in our day. In our day, you can get a free Bible in virtually any hotel room in America. You can read the Bible online for free on hundreds of websites in dozens of different English translations. You can listen to the Bible teaching on the radio for free. You can watch Bible teaching on television for free. You can read the Bible on your smartphone with a free Bible app. Don't insult my intelligence by telling me I don't have a Bible. If anything, we're paralyzed in trying to choose which Bible to read. One of my favorite stories in the Bible about people who loved learning the Word of God is found over in Nehemiah chapter 8. Let's flip over there and take a look at that story this morning. That might be one of those books you have to look in your table of contents to find if you're not used to it. Or if you're good with the fan flip and a quick eye. 
The books of Ezra and Nehemiah tell the story of the return of the Jewish exiles from Babylonian activity. Uh, activity. Captivity. It's one of them days. <laughs> Misbehaving mouth. When these people arrived back in Jerusalem, there wasn't much left of their old home. Nehemiah led a massive operation to rebuild the protective walls around the city of Jerusalem and then provided leadership and government for the people. Ezra served as the spiritual leader of the people and helped reestablish their spiritual life following the rebuilding of the temple. And Nehemiah chapter 8, and actually I want to start reading in the second half of the last verse of Nehemiah chapter 7. It says, when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. And all the people gathered as one man in the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. People of all ages <clears throat> gathered in the city of Jerusalem in the square to listen to Ezra read the word of God to them. And the thing that strikes me in this first verse are the words, they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book. The people asked Ezra to do this. They wanted him to teach the word of God to them. They were eager and hungry for the word of God. They were committed learners of the word of God. They wanted to learn it. So in verse 2, it continues, it says, So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard, on the first day of the seventh month, and he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So people of all ages, men and women, they gather together and children old enough to understand and Ezra reads the word of God to them from daybreak until noon, which would, which would have been a period of about five hours. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the word of the Lord, to the book of the law. Now, can you imagine standing there listening attentively to the Old Testament books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy being read to you for five hours straight. Some of us have trouble sitting for 30 minutes listening to a very dynamic teaching at a church service. much less sitting through five hours of Bible reading from the book of the law. These people had tremendous respect and honor for the word of God. We need the Lord to create in us that same kind of respect and honor and hunger for the word of God. Verse 4 says, And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood a bunch of guys on his right and a bunch of guys on his left. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and the people answered, Amen, amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So Ezra was standing on this special wooden platform that had been built for this purpose so that all the people could see him and hear him, and he had 13 other men on either side of him, leaders of the people, and as Ezra opened the book of the law, all the people stood up, showing the incredible respect and reverence they had for the word of God. And Ezra praised the great God, the Lord, and the people responded by shouting, Amen, Amen, 
And then they bow down with their faces to the ground and worship the Lord. I mean, what an awesome sight that must have been to see. All of those thousands of people bowing down and worshiping the Lord together. These people were filled with a deep, solemn respect for the word of God. They saw it as a holy thing. They listened to it as if the words were coming directly from the lips of God himself. Verse 7, also, Jeshua and a whole bunch of other guys here, Levites, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. So while the word of God was being read to the people, It says the Levites were going around explaining it to them so that they could understand what it meant and how to apply it to their lives. They were having a big Bible study. Verse 9, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. As the word of God was being read to them, the people, they begin weeping. They were being cut to the heart with conviction about their sin and their neglect of the word of God. It's a beautiful thing to see people who are humble before the word of God and allowing it to speak to them like that. The tears of repentance, they produce in our lives a healing. Many in our day, they act like the worst thing that could possibly happen to a person is for them to feel guilty about the things that they have done and have failed to do. It can be a good thing for us to experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit over our sin, to have the Lord take us behind the proverbial woodshed for a little reminder about who's in charge and who needs to straighten his act up. That can be a good thing. It can actually open us up to receive the Lord's forgiveness and healing. I mean, when we've been doing wrong, we know it. We need to stop it. The Lord confronts us with that sin, what we have been doing. We acknowledge that wrong. We repent of it. He then is able to forgive us and remind us of his love and restore that relationship with us so that we're not living in this fear. He sets us back on our feet. We're able to move forward, renewed, encouraged, refocused. That's a good thing. So don't run from the Lord's disciplining hand in your life. You can trust him. Sometimes we need a little kick in the pants. Sometimes we need to be taken behind the woodshed. I know I do, and I'm grateful for it when it's been done. But it's not a place to stay. And that's what Nehemiah and Ezra and the Levites are telling the people here. They tell them to stop weeping because this is a day for rejoicing. The Lord has blessed them. He has brought them back from captivity. He has given them a rebuilt temple and protective walls surrounding their city again. The reading and the teaching of the word of God is being reestablished. Their great and awesome God has done great and awesome things for them. Rejoice, they tell them. Verse 10, then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people saying, be quiet for this day is holy, do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Up in verse 10, it it makes me laugh a little bit when it says, go your way, eat the fat 
and drink sweet wine. It makes me laugh because I imagine how this must sound to the nutrition Nazis among us. <laughs> Eat the fat! Oh! They're telling the people to eat delicious foods of celebration. Now, if soybean curd and pine nuts is the thing that communicates celebration to you, then go for that. (laughs) And down in verse 12, it says, Great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. The Word of God can make our hearts sing with joy when we are hungry for it and it is taught clearly so that we can understand it. I mean, when the Word of God is skillfully taught under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it has a powerful effect upon our hearts. And great joy is always the result of that. There have been many times when I have been listening to the skilled, anointed teaching of the Word of God and my heart just burns within me with excitement and joy. There are a few things better. Some of the most precious, most memorable, most powerful moving times in my life as a Christian were as me sitting, listening to the Word of God being clearly taught under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Oh, what a powerful thing that is. Let us pray that God would give that to us. New pastors on the way, I guess, but uh, (laughs) just kidding. The Word of God renews our mind, and this is this process of transformation that God does in us. Let's flip over to Romans chapter 12 for a moment. We talked about the first verse of Romans chapter 12 last time when we were talking about worship. Today we want to settle in on the second verse a little bit. But let's begin by reading the first verse again. Paul is writing, he says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In this second verse, we're told to be transformed. And the meanings, I mean, and the means of accomplishing that transformation is the renewal of our mind. What makes it possible for us to discern the will of God, for us to know what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So he begins, he says, do not be conformed to this world. The word translated conformed, it means to shape oneself to a particular pattern or mold. We're told not to conform to this world. Don't shape ourselves to the pattern of this world. Don't be like this world. When Paul refers to this world, he's talking about the culture and the society that we live in, which doesn't acknowledge and seek to follow the will of God. As a follower of Christ, we have a different pattern, a different mold we are to shape ourselves to. It's the pattern of Jesus Christ. He's the one we're to conform ourselves to. We're a part of a new kingdom the kingdom of God. And as citizens of this new kingdom, we have a new way of living, new goals, new concerns, new purposes for living, and a new moral code to live by. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That Greek word that's translated transformed is metamorpho, which we get the word metamorphosis from. Metamorphosis is that term that we use to describe the transformation that takes place, for example, when a butterfly pops out from the cocoon that a caterpillar creates. A caterpillar changes to a butterfly, and that's a metamorphosis.
in contrast to shaping ourselves to the pattern of this world, we are to be transformed. A metamorphosis into the likeness of Jesus Christ. By the renewal of your mind. This transformation, it takes place through the renewal of our mind, our thinking, our understanding of reality, the way we react to situations and circumstances, the way that we see ourselves, the choices that we make. I want to caution you against trying to draw a clear distinction between what is mind and spirit and soul and heart and body and various other terms that are used to identify parts of our being. Some people really go to town on this stuff, but many of these terms are used interchangeably in the Bible, even by the same writer in the same book sometimes. So we're better served and we will have a better understanding of what's being said if we pay attention to the context of the passage and how the word is being used in that context rather than imposing a particular definition onto a word and then try to establish what is being said. So here, our mind, as that term is being used in this context, is the core of who we are. It's that part of us that does the thinking and the problem solving and the directing of us. It's the fundamental me that determines the choices and actions that I take. And when my mind is transformed, I am transformed. This transformation is done by the Holy Spirit. And as we learned in our study of Galatians, we cooperate with this transforming work of the Holy Spirit by walking with the Spirit, by living in step with the Spirit, by doing those things that cooperate with and are consistent with the good work that he's doing in us. For example, over Colossians 3, 5, this is the way Paul words it in the way that we walk with the Spirit. We cooperate. We walk step for step with him as he is transforming us. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self and its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. We go back to Romans 12, 2 again. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. By testing, measuring, comparing everything with the life of Jesus and the word of God, We're able to discern, to discover, to determine, to figure out, to assess, to conclude what is God's will for us, what he considers good, acceptable, and perfect. Do you know what a touchstone is? A touchstone is a reference or standard against which things can be evaluated or tested to determine their quality. As followers of Christ, our touchstone is Jesus Christ, the living word of God. He's our standard against which we compare and test the quality of our life, of ourself, of our character and our behavior. And the Bible is our main reference for doing that. So now you know the meaning behind the name of our church, Touchstone Christian Fellowship. It's a reference to our touchstone. Jesus Christ, the living word of God. Our living sacrifice, which is a life lived as an act of worship to the Lord, Romans 12, 1, 
becomes more and more beautiful and pure as we are transformed and we live increasingly in conformity with his perfect will. Romans 12, 2. I want to talk briefly at the end here about regular Bible reading. It's essential for our spiritual growth. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul writes, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, if you already have some kind of regular Bible reading method that you use, I encourage you to keep at it. But if you don't have a regular habit of reading the Bible, I want to give some suggestions to help you get started. First is get a modern English translation of the Bible, such as New International Version, English Standard Version, New King James Version, New Living Translation. The original King James Version has a beautiful poetic style to it because of its antique English language, but the problem is that most people today are better off reading a more modern English translation so that you understand what you're reading. Most of us are not so good at Shakespearean English. So if you want to memorize from King James or whatever, that's fine. But uh, for, for, for most folks, read the Bible in a modern English translation so that you know what's being said. Read a book of the Bible from start to finish. Don't skip around reading a little of one book of the Bible and then reading a little of another book of the Bible. We don't do that with other books. Why would we do that with the Bible? There are 66 separate books bound together in a single volume that we call the Bible. Treat each of those 66 books as a complete unit. Don't treat the Bible like it's some kind of magic charm or a Ouija board. Closing your eyes, praying, asking the Lord to give you some guidance, fan, flip your Bible, drop your finger, start reading. That's not modeled in the Bible anywhere as the kind of behavior that the Lord wants us to have. That's not how we're to get guidance from the Lord. Read a book. Start to finish. Familiarize yourself with all of the content. Put the Bible here. Don't play these superstitious games with your Bible. If you don't know which book of the Bible to start reading, you go, 66 of them, which one should I start with? If you've never really done it before, I think the Gospel of Mark is a great place to start. So go to your table of contents, find the Gospel of Mark. Sometimes it's called just Mark. That's a good one for you to start with. And then after that, start working your way through the rest of the New Testament books. Read a chapter or two a day. Try to be consistent. Reading every day if you can. Don't panic. Some people get a chapter or two. It's only a page or two. Chapters in the Bible are really short. And then lastly, I would encourage you to keep a journal of your reading so that you can look back later over where you've been and maybe what the Lord has shown you and how he's spoken to your heart and the places that he's led you and where he's brought you. A simple method for a Bible journal is to follow the acronym SOAP, S-O-A-P. S stands for scripture, O stands for observation, A, application, P, prayer. So scripture, just write down the scripture reference that you read that day. 
just get a notebook with some lines in it. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. You want to get a cute one, you want to get one with doilies, you know, whatever. Or, you know, get a manly one with a metal ring down the... Doesn't matter. Just get something you can write in. So S, write down the scripture reference, observation. Write down an observation or a thought that you make about the reading that you did that day. Application, write down an application for your life drawn from the reading. How you can use this in your life. What kind of action the Lord is asking you to take in response to what you've read. And in prayer, fourth, lastly is P for prayer. Spend time praying, talking with the Lord about what you've read, and maybe write down a prayer request that you have that's related to all of that. And it's exciting to be able to go back months later and, and read some of those and see what God has done in your life. So in closing this morning, use your GPS for life. Devote yourself to the apostles' teaching. Learn the word of God. Read the Bible. I close with some verses from Psalm 19. Verse 7. It says, The law of the Lord, or the word of God, is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than pure gold, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray for all of us, myself included, Father, that you would grow in us a genuine, deep love for your word. We're challenged by the people in Nehemiah's day as they attentively listen to and desire to learn your word, Lord. And I pray that we would have that same kind of desire for your word. May we devote ourselves to the word of God, the teaching of the apostles, so that we may know Jesus better and our relationship with you would grow. In your name we pray these things, Jesus. Amen.